the uh, in the early services, I'm fortunate enough to get to to get to be preaching, and um, I really I'm really enjoying it. And we've been walking through the book of First John, and uh, the book of First John is it's one of my favorite books. If you uh, how many of y'all raise your hand if you've been to the early service? If you're in the early service, and it's a lot of y'all. All right, well, I, it might be some review then for some of you guys. Um, I've been thinking about a couple of different a couple of different places that uh, <clears throat> that we uh, that I wanted to touch on. Um, I still got two or three things that are rolling around. I may go to, may go to both of them. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna let's go go with me to First John chapter three, and I'm going to continue. We stopped this morning in. Uh, In the third verse, so I'm going to read those to you and just tell you what we talked about a little bit to catch you up. And then I'm going to go on into the rest of that chapter. And what you need to know tonight is is something you, if you've been here for any length of time, you probably already know this, but it's something that we need to be reminded. John, in this book, what's what's happening for you guys who hadn't been around, what's happening is the there's people coming into the church in, in the, the churches that John wrote this letter to. Uh, most of y'all already know this background. And they were saying that Jesus, you know, isn't enough. They, they wouldn't really say it that way. Jesus isn't enough. But they would say that Jesus is the baby steps. Jesus is the baby steps. He is how you actually get into the kingdom. He's actually how you, you know, that's a good thing that you come into the gospel. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing that you are, are following Jesus and that you love the gospel and that you have entered into this covenant with God. But now that you're in the covenant, these people would say, you know, uh, you probably need to go on to the higher level. You probably need to go on and, and, and get to that higher spirituality that we have. Get to that higher relationship with God. You need to go on and you need to leave that, uh, those elementary doctrines. There's a passage in Hebrews that says, let us leaving the elementary doctrines of Christ. I love to explain that to you. It does not mean let's leave the gospel. It, what it means, well, well I ain't going to explain it to you. I don't have time. But it, it's saying, he was saying that there were people that have, were coming in. He calls them in, in chapter 2 of First John, he calls them antichrists. He said they're preaching against Christ by saying that you need something more than Christ to have peace in your life. You need something more than the gospel. Most of us around here, especially in this area, one way or another, you have been, you have been uh, exposed to the gospel. You have been exposed to the name of Christ. You've seen the green Jesus signs. You probably have, you know, if you've got kids playing ball, most of the ball teams and leagues are around here still pray before they go out on the field and that's a wonderful thing you really ought to be thankful that's a blessing from god they don't do that all over the country anymore uh some of you probably still have teachers that are here uh in in this county crockett county and surrounding counties that still pray with their students in in the classroom that's show enough a blessing because they could get in a lot of trouble if the right people hear about that but most of them really don't care and so that's a good thing that that we have been we've been we live in a part of the country we live in a part of the world where the gospel is um, it, it's readily apparent. The problem is that there's a lot of people that's not preaching it. It's not that it's it's not that it's hidden, but it's a lot of people that in order to bolster the role of the church, in order to uh, get the money up in the church, what we want to do is we want to put the blue and the green lights up and we want to put the smoke machines. We've done that before for youth things that have gone on and we want to have the big backdrop with all the colors and we want to have this all this stuff. You know, I saw a video this week. It, it, it liked to make me throw up. It was a, a, a quote unquote pastor. I use that term very loosely, uh, but he was standing on stage with dudes dressed up like the Flash and Superman and Batman. And he was supposedly preaching a sermon that had to do with all that kind of mess. And so what we've done is what I say, what we've done is what the world is doing is they're saying there's a segment of the people that say, you know what, the gospel, that's just stupid. And we're not even blah, blah, blah. And we know that that's we know they, they don't entice us at all. We know that that's just foolishness. We know that's just pride. We know that's just humanity, the wicked heart of humans. But there's another segment that says, you know, the gospel is good. But there's so much more that you can have. And what that does, and you've you've heard me beating this drum for years, I'm sure. But what that does is that makes people go to look for their peace. 
Go to look for their happiness. Go to look for their satisfaction. Go to look for their joy in places that cannot provide happiness, that cannot provide joy, that cannot provide peace. They'll do it in religious places. They'll do it in quote unquote spiritual places. If you come to say, if somebody comes to you and this has happened a myriad of times and they'll say, you know what? I just don't have peace. I don't have any happiness. I, I don't have joy. I don't, uh, I, I don't have, uh, uh, assurance. I'm just depressed all the time and I don't understand. And I don't know if God's hearing my prayers and I don't know if, you know, all these things going on. Most people that counsel people that come with those kind of problems will not counsel them using the gospel. They will counsel them using works. They'll counsel them using right thinking. They'll counsel them using moralistic prescriptions. You'll walk out of their office or their home or whoever it is that's giving you advice. And you'll say, you know what? I'm going to start doing better. I'm going to start thinking better. I'm going to be more positive. Now, it's a great thing to be positive. I'm not saying right thinking, positive thinking, claiming the promises of God. Those are all good things. But when it comes right down to the nuts and bolts, when it comes right down to the concrete that you're going to have to stand on in order to face the world, in order to face the flesh, in order to face the devil, you're going to have to have more than positive thinking. You're going to have to have the gospel. You're going to have the gospel of Christ and you're going to have to stand in that. And when the trials of the world come, the, the, the things, the sin comes, the flesh comes, the devil comes, however it comes, the world comes to tempt you and to try you, you have got to have that foundation, that rock. When the wind blows and the storm rages that you won't be blown off of that gospel of Christ. And so in 1 John, this letter, there were men coming in claiming to be teachers. They were claiming to, you know, say... That basically is is a little more complicated than this, but I'm going to simplify it for you. Basically, they were saying, hey, we got the stuff. We got the new thing that, that, you know, you probably ain't even heard of yet. We've got the teaching. We've got the ministry. We've got the new book. We've got the new program. We've got the stuff that you've been missing all this time. And all you need to do is follow us. All you need to do is hear us. And they had gone out from the church. They had gone out from the fellowship of the believers. And they were doing their own thing. Had their own thing going. They would still call themselves Christians. And John is writing, telling these people, no, that's not correct. They are anti-Christ. They went out from among us because they were not of us. And if they would have been of us, they would have no doubt remained. And then in the beginning of chapter 3, he said, we... Talking about us, those who've been born again, we've been adopted. And we went into great detail this morning about what it means to be adopted, adopted into Christ. But what I want to show you tonight is something, it's a passage that you've read. It's a passage that we're all familiar with. And it's uh, it's one that I was going to do next Sunday as we go through chapter verse 4 through verse 10 in chapter 3. And these are some of the most um, frightening verses. That you could possibly read because what what John is doing here is he's saying, listen, he's gone through and I wish you could have been here this morning. He has told us without a shadow of a doubt, you're adopted in Christ and there's nothing that can take that away. There's no higher blessing that you can have. Uh, Let me let me just share just a little bit because I, I need you to understand the good side before I show you what may be considered by some to be the bad side. But what we talked about was Christ came. The son of God has always been father, son, Holy spirit. You probably heard me say this before. It's always before there was trees, before there was creation, before there was Adam and Eve, before there was any angels, before there was anything that was created, there was only father, son, and Holy spirit. God has always existed as father, son, and Holy spirit. And he has always been love. He is love today because he loved the father, loved the son, son, loved the father, vice versa. And the spirits in there as well. So what the son of God did for you and did for me was What he did was he descended, he condescended to take on a human nature, to take on human flesh. And of course, you know the story. He came born of a virgin, never sinned, kept the law. He died on a cross, gave himself to be killed on a cross. He uh, was buried in a tomb three days later, resurrected. He ascended from the grave. He ascended to heaven. And when he ascended, he as our representative brought us with him to the throne room of God and sat down at the right hand of the father saying it is finished. 
for the first time in the history of the universe, a man, a lowly man came to the throne room of God, was accepted by God, glorified by God, given a name that is greater than every other name and everything in creation will bow down to that name. And the Bible says that if you are in him, then all of his, all of what's his is yours. In Revelation, he says, I'll grant you the one that overcomes. I'll grant you to sit on my throne with me. I'll grant you that kingdom. The Bible tells us that we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It says you have been seated in heavenly places right now. You are an adopted son and daughter of Christ if you have been born again. So you got two sides to this thing. On the one hand, there is absolutely nothing that can take your inheritance. You are a co-heir with Christ. He said, Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. That's us who've been born again. We are his brothers and his sisters. God only has one natural born son, but you and I have been adopted into that family. And we, he sees us the same way that he sees his own son. And so that adoption that he has given us is the redemption of our soul, the perfection of our, of our souls before God. So when the father looks at you, you've heard this, I know. When the father looks at you, he sees his son and that is the absolute perfection. That's perfection. And so John wants to make sure we know in this book, especially the first two chapters, that if you have Christ, you have perfection in God's sight. There is no higher level to reach. There's no uh, uh, stepping ladder to get up any high. You know, there's no there's no. Well, if I do this, God will love me more. God can't love you more if he loves you in Christ. God, can, God cannot love you more if he loves you in Christ. Now, God loves the whole world. We know that. But if he loves you in Christ, you have everything. You have all the promises of God in Christ. They're yea and amen. There's nothing lacking. You flip over from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And every single promise in that book, you can say, that's mine. I'm an heir of God. I'm a co-heir with Christ. That's mine. It belongs to me. We talked about this morning, if you're adopted into a family, you become part of the family. You're not second class. You're not working to make sure you get to stay there. You are part of the family. The judge, some, most times in certain states, will even change your birth certificate, wipe out the biological parents that are on your birth certificate, certificate and write the adoptive parents in so it's as if you were always part of the family. When you come to Christ, you have been perfected in his sight. But here's the thing that you need to make sure that you see. So the, the question that we have is not, is, is God good enough? Is God powerful enough? Is God uh, powerful enough to keep me? Is he powerful enough to, to mold me and make me? Even though when I fail and when I fall, that's what First John in, in chapter 1 verse 9, he says, look, when you sin, if you confess it, he's faithful. He is just, he, he will forgive you of that sin and he will cleanse you from all, uh, all, uh, unrighteousness. And it says in that first chapter, it says that if you say my friend that you don't have any sin, you're lying. So we, we don't need to play, we don't need to play the mass game that I've got it all going on and everything's wonderful and everything's fine in my life and I don't have any sin and I don't have any problems. I don't have any troubles. I'm doing everything perfectly just the way Jesus did when he was. We don't even need to play that game. The gospel is so good. We don't have to. We don't have to play that game. We don't have to be in despair because our hearts uh, still have a war against the flesh going on in them. We don't have to be in despair of that. Because the gospel is so beautiful. It's so wonderful that we know that we've been forgiven. That's one side. So listen, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I've heard Brother Eddie say it again, so I know I'm okay to say it. But even, even if I never did anything, the gospel's good enough to save me. It's good enough to save me. If I never crack my Bible, never come to church again, 1 John, uh, John 3, 16 would be enough for me to be righteous and stand before God and be forgiven. But there is also salvation doesn't come by itself. It doesn't come as 
a sign that hangs around your neck because I walked down the I walked down an aisle one day and I prayed a prayer after the preacher or I, I said what somebody wanted me to say and I was you know I was I was in trouble and maybe my wife left me and I knew I needed to get her back and the only way to get her back was to let her think I got saved and to give me a clean slate everything's wiped away and I don't have to worry about it anymore. There's lots of reasons for you to walk this aisle. Lots of reasons for you to come down here. Lots of reasons for you to come to these altars and say, oh, I need to be saved. The evidence that you have been saved is that the Holy Spirit is molding you and making you and he is changing your heart. You've heard that before. You're going to hear it again because that is the only truth that you have to stand on. Understand You don't have to work for anything. You can't work for anything. Good luck. All our righteousness is filthy rags. So you don't have to, you don't have to reach a certain level of goodness. Let me have your eyes. Why don't you look at me for a minute? You don't have to have a certain level of goodness in order to be saved. You don't have to make it a certain level in order for God to love you. If you've been adopted by Christ, if you've been adopted by the father and God sees you in Christ, you've got everything. And the evidence that that is in your life, the evidence that that is true is that you will be daily conformed to the image of Christ. It's a fact. You can't get around it. Let me read to you. We read this morning the first three verses in John, 1 John chapter 3. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. We are, have been born again into his family. We've been adopted. He said, Therefore, that's why the world don't know you. That's why I don't know you, because they didn't know him. He says, Beloved, right now, as you're sitting here, I don't care how you feel. I don't care what's going through your mind. I don't care what trials you have, what sufferings you have, what things you've going on. Right now, we are the sons of God. We Right now, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doesn't appear yet what will be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We have a hope waiting for us. Incorruptible, imperishable, cannot be faded away. No moth can get it. No rust can get it. We have stored up treasures in heaven for ourselves by trusting in Christ. And he is the greatest treasure that we can have. He says, you've got a hope that you're looking forward to. And then verse three introduces what we're going to read. It says, every man that has this hope in him, what does he do? He purifies himself. He is being sanctified by the spirit of God. Every man, this is, I told him this morning, this is not a command. This is not a suggestion. This is not saying, hey guys, if you want to be righteous, you better start purifying yourself. It's not saying that. It is a flat out fact. Every man, every man, you're not exempt. I'm not exempt. Your grandmama's not exempt. Your little baby's not exempt. Every person who has been adopted by Christ is doing what? They are purifying themselves. It's not to say that they're working for anything, but the spirit of God has given them a new heart. And that new heart is always going to chase after what it loves. You're going to do what you love. I don't care what it is, whether it's baseball, eating steak, going shopping, cleaning house. I don't know why y'all would love cleaning house, but some people do. Whatever it is that you love, you're going to do it. I promise you. You're going to make time to do it. You're going to make time to do what you love to do. You're going to make time for what your heart desires. When you've been adopted into this family, the spirit of God comes. And in chapter two, it says it gives us an unction. It gives us an anointing and it will cause you to love serving God and seeking after God, walking after God. And you will do, you will do what you love. I promise you. If you show, I can, I mean, I won't get too far into this deal, but you show me what you're spending your money on and you're sacrificing for, and I'll tell you what you love. You show me what you're spending your time on and what you're sacrificing your time for, I'll show you what you love. You tell me what your life is centered on, what your life purpose is focused on, and I'll show you who your God is. You will do what you love. And so here we have the distinction. There's a lot of people that love that first part. They say, I've been adopted into the family of God. Praise God. I prayed it and I really, really, really meant it. 
But there's no spirit that causes them to keep God's commandments. There's no spirit that causes them to desire to walk after his statutes, to desire him, to love him, to seek after him. Maybe you're doing the right things. I'm coming to church. I'm, uh, I'm nice to everybody and I just try to live my life. And why has it got to be so tough? And I'm just, I, I'm just making it the best that I can. We're talking about what your heart desires, what it's pointing after. The evidence, I'm going to read it to you. It's not just my thinking. I'm going to read it to you right here. The evidence that you have been born again, adopted into this family, is that you have a love to serve God. You have a love to please God. You have a love to walk after his ways. Are you doing it perfectly? No, we're not talking about perfection. But you, your heart's desire, because your heart's been changed, is to seek after him. To chase him like you would chase after your free time or your fun time or your money or your job or your family or whatever it is that brings you pleasure. You seek after it. You chase after it. You point everything in your life towards it and you get after it. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. You'll sacrifice whatever. And I will too. I'll sacrifice whatever it takes to get what I love. All you guys, you know, you know, uh, the, well, the deal where the, 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 the wife comes home. She says, look, I bought a new dress. It was only $300. She said, $300. And then next week, come on, honey, I got a good deal on a bass boat. You'll make a sacrifice for what you love. You'll make a sacrifice for what's important for you. And we all do it. I mean, it's the it's same thing. We'll, we'll all do it. But you will chase what you love. You can't help but chase what you love. It's a calling inside of you that I, I'm going to go after what I love and I'm going to make, you know, whatever, whatever it takes. If I have to take time out of my schedule to do this, if I have to skip that, if I have to wait on this, I'm going to go and do what I love. I'm going to have what I love. I'm going to be chasing after what I love. And what I'm telling you today, and what we're going to see here in this text, verse 4 through 10, is that you... If you've been born again, if you've been adopted in this family, you don't have to work for nothing. It's given. You're you're co-heir with Christ. You have everything he has to give. But with that comes a Holy Spirit inside of you that is going to change what you love. And that's the evidence. Let's read it. And I'll show you that I'm not just talking off the top of my head. It says, Whosoever committeth sin, this is verse 4, chapter 3. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law, the breaking of the law. You say, well, I ain't really broke no laws. I'm good. Good luck to you. The greatest law is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, let's see how many of y'all done that today. Every, every second it clicks by on the clock with everything. Have you loved him? Have you worshipped him as he has deserved to be worshipped? You loved him as he has deserved to be loved. If not, James says, if you broke one, one law, you're guilty of it all. Amen. So you can just grab hold of the whole book of the law and say, I'm guilty of it. And so it says, whoever commits sin is transgressing, is transgressing of the law. And it says, and you know... That Jesus was manifested. The reason he came was to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. And then he says, so whosoever abideth in him, that word abide has been real big in the last section of chapter two. And in the first part of chapter three, he says, whoever is abiding in him doesn't sin. He sinneth not. Whoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that if I stub my toe and sin, if I go out and do something stupid, that means I don't know him? No, this is in the present tense, which in it's a different aspect. It means that it's a continuous lifestyle, habitual practice of sin. Whoever is sinning, whoever is living in sin, whoever loves their sin, whoever is making a habit of their sin, whoever is walking in that sin, they don't know Christ. Simple as that. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that, this is present tense as well, doeth righteousness, is doing righteousness. It's talking about walking in righteousness. That is the man who is righteous. He's been made righteous. 
Now, get a hold of what he's saying. There's two types of righteousness that he's talking about in this verse. Go back to the other verse, verse 7, Tyler. Two types of righteousness. One is that you've been made righteous, not by your righteousness, but by Christ's righteousness. You are righteous, not because you do righteousness. You're righteous, not because you do anything good or you're acting good or you're keeping the law or anything like that. By the law, no flesh will be justified. You are, you are righteous in one and only way. And that's when Jesus Christ comes, saves your soul, pays for your sin and, and imparts the Holy Spirit into you. He says, but the evidence of that righteousness that you possess in Jesus is that you will be doing righteousness. You will be walking in righteousness. Are you doing it perfectly? No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a life that has been turned. Like Brother Eddie talked about repentance this morning. It's a turn. You go on left and you turn. You go in 180 degrees, you go the other direction. We're talking about a life that has been seeking nothing but self, that has been seeking nothing but pleasure and happiness and, and whatever and worldly things. And that life all of a sudden touched by the Holy Spirit, born again by the Spirit of God, it turns in repentance and it heads in the direction to seek after righteousness, to seek Him, His kingdom, His his righteousness to do those things. He says, the one that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as Christ is righteous. Now go to the next verse. Now listen, this is very important for you to understand. Look at me. He that commit a sin, lifestyle, habitual sin over and over and over and doesn't have any problem walking in sin, doesn't have any problem living in sin, doesn't have any problem chasing after sin. He is of the devil. John chapter eight, John said, Jesus told these, these Pharisees that were questioning him. He said, they said, we're Abraham's children. We have God as our father in John chapter eight. He said, No, your father is the devil. He said, if God were your father, you'd love me. He says, if Abraham were your father, you'd do the works of Abraham and you would have, you trust in me. Abraham longed to see my day and he rejoiced. That's what he said in John chapter eight. And he says, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. That's his modus operandi. That's his MO. That's what he does. He sins. He sinned from the very beginning. And this is the very purpose that the son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works that the devil is doing. That he might destroy the sin that has captured humanity. He might destroy the slavery to sin that our hearts are in. That's why he came. That's his purpose. Now, it, think with me just for a minute. Let's reason together. It, it doesn't take it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if I'm walking and loving and enjoying and living in the very thing that Jesus was manifest for to take away, it doesn't really make sense for me to say that I'm in Jesus, does it? That's like if Jesus is if Jesus is walking north and I'm walking south. How can I say I'm following Jesus? He's going that way. He's going this way and I'm going in a different direction. But I still say, oh, I'm following Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Understand what he's saying here. He says the son of God was crucified. He appeared. He gave himself on a cross in order to take away sin. So if sin is not systematically being taken away in your life and you're not growing in holiness and righteousness and faith and repentance, you're not growing in those things, seeking after those things. You should not even pretend like you have any assurance that you've been born again, because that's the reason Jesus came. The reason he came was to destroy the works of the devil. And he did that once for all in the father's eyes. When we look right now, remember the very first verse we read right now, we are the sons of God. We're not working for it. It's a done deal. He said it's finished, but I don't know about you, but in my walking around life, sometimes I don't act like son of God. Sometimes as that flesh wars with that spirit, I I know it's hard for y'all to believe, but I might. I might say something stupid. I know, shocker. Renee told me they was laughing about me in their Sunday school class because I never smiled in pictures or something. I might do all kinds of things stupid. If you took a snapshot, those, those, I hate having my picture taken as a why, but 
you take a snapshot of me in any given moment and you could probably make all kind of cases for why I'm, you know, maybe my, maybe my, my demeanor is not good. Maybe somebody cut me off in traffic. Maybe my, you know, whatever. But when you look at the movie reel of my life, what you will see if I'm a believer is a constant growth toward holiness toward righteousness, towards seeking after God, towards, towards following his ways. I ain't, I ain't there yet. I'm not there yet by any stretch of the imagination. But I got to tell you, I'm a whole lot better today than I was when he first saved me. Now, sometimes it's hard for me to see it because the more that he, the more he shows himself to me, the more wretched I look. I'm like, I didn't even know I had this sin. I didn't even know I had this wickedness in me. My goodness. Has that been there the whole time? But I can promise you that I'm, I'm, I'm chasing after him. Let's put it that way. I'm chasing after him more today than I was that first, that first whatever. You know, I mean, y'all know the story. The first, first month that I was here, brother, they pretty much locked me in the office because I didn't run three families off in a week and a half and... <laughs> He's like, you just sit right here and man that phone and be good. <laughs> little, hopefully I'm a little more compassionate today. <laughs> we all laughing at it. That ain't funny. <laughs> he that committeth sin is of the devil. Go to verse 9. We're going to stop at verse 9 and 10. Now listen. This, this right here is something that you need to internalize. It's something that you need to make sure that you understand. And I hope you're paying attention. It says, whoever, everybody, all those, anybody who is born of God does not commit ongoing lifestyle habitual is what that present tense signifies sin. He doesn't live in the sin. He doesn't live in it. He doesn't enjoy it. He doesn't relish it. He doesn't make excuses for it. He doesn't justify it. That's the one thing. That's the one thing I still work on. You know, when Dana will come and we'll have an argument and she'll say, why didn't you do this? My first response is, well, why didn't you do what you did four months ago? You know, I, I, I want to get my I want to get my jab in there. I want to justify myself. I want to say, well, you know what? You ain't that good either. You know, we, that's what I want to do. Who's, whosoever's been born of God, he doesn't live in that sin. He doesn't justify his sin. The law came to stop the mouth. And this is very important. I need you to really pay attention. It says the one who's been born again, whosoever, anyone who has been born again, everyone who has been born again, he does not commit sin. And this is why. For his Christ's seed remains in him. It's not that you're just doing good or that you should do good or that you know that you need to do good or you got to try better. The reason he does not continue in sin is because God's seed, the Holy Spirit, is now inside of him. And look, it says he cannot sin. He cannot remain in that sin. He cannot live in that sin. He cannot practice that sin. Why? Because he has been born of God. Do you understand what this verse is saying? I'm not saying do better. We all need to do better. I'm not saying you need to walk out of those doors and say, I need to stop this and stop that. You probably do. There's probably a lot of things you need to stop. A lot of things I need to stop. The point of the verse is the evidence that you have been born again, that you have been born of God, is that you do not Love sin. You hate sin and cannot walk in sin. Sin hurts when it comes about and the flesh wars with the spirit. And sometimes we allow that flesh to just win and we do what the flesh wants. Understand conviction comes. We can't stay in that sin. It is impossible for you to walk and live in habitual sin and God not chastise you. The Holy Spirit not come to you because you have been born of God. That's what it says. Cannot sin. Cannot remain in sin. Cannot live in habitual sin. Why can he not? Because he has been born of God. Don't get it backwards. Don't get it backwards and say, well, if if I try really hard and I don't sin, I'm going to be born of God. That's backwards. It, It doesn't work that way. That's not the way it works. 
You're born of God. And therefore, you cannot remain in habitual, ongoing lifestyle of sin. You cannot. God is a good father. He's a good shepherd. All those, all those pictures of God. He, he chastises those that he loves. Revelation says, I, I rebuke those that I love. I discipline those that I love. You cannot remain in that sin and think that I have the assurance that I've been born again. And you're, you're, li- you're listening to this from a person who lived that way for a long time. I, you know, most of y'all know my story, all that. I don't have to go through all the sinful things and all the wicked things I used to be. When I decided, hey, you know what? When Jacob was born, one year old, when Jacob was one year old, I decided, you know what? I'm going to give all that up because I know that it's wrong and I don't want to raise my kid in that life. And I went back to church and I sat in the church for three years as Jacob grew. And I never crossed my mind, never crossed my mind because why? Because, you know, hey, back when I was 11, I prayed the prayer. I've always believed in a Jesus I've always believed that there was a man who came, who was God's son, who was crucified, who was raised from that. I always believed that. I've never not believed that. And that's what I was riding on. But even in that three years of that church, I can tell you, I was living in sin. I was loving sin. I was doing all I could do, as much as I could do, having as much fun as I wanted to, thinking it was the greatest thing ever. And I was assured. I was assured. I'm good. I'm good when the reality is the Bible says that if you live that way, there is no way that you can have assurance. You should you should be terrified. You should be you should be afraid if you love sin, love to live in sin. Don't love to seek after his. I'm not talking about how good you're doing. Get that out of your mind. I'm not saying you got to do good enough to be assured. I'm saying your assurance comes from the fact that God is working in your heart to cause you to love his commands, to cause you to love him. Last verse, chapter 10, verse 10. It says, now just in case you, just in case you ain't buying what I've been, what I've been saying so far. It says in this, in what? In the fact that his children can't live in sin. They can't live in habitual sin without Christ coming to discipline them. They can't do it. He says, in this, the children of God are manifest. He's saying, this is how we know who the children of God are and the children of the devil. He says, whosoever doeth not righteousness, walking in a life of seeking after righteousness, they're not of God. And neither is he that doesn't love his brother. That's a big thing in first John love for the brethren. You don't have love for the brethren. Good luck. I don't know how you can possibly have assurance. You can say all day long, Jason, I love you. You are the most wonderful person in the world. And you'd be right. You know, you could say all that kind of stuff. But if you said, if you said, I love you so much and you're the greatest ever, but I hate your wife. You need to keep her away from me. You're not going to have no fellowship with me. either. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. So for the man that says, you know what? I just love Jesus and I'm all about Jesus. But the church can just go take a flying leap. No, you don't know Jesus. You don't know Christ. And I can prove it passage after passage in first John. So what I need you to see today, what I need you to see, this is not a do better message. Don't walk out the door saying, I got to do better. I'm sure you need to do better. A lot of y'all need to do better. I need to do better. God's working on all of us to make us who he wants to be. He's not going to start something. He ain't going to finish. We all need to do better. The question the text is asking us here is, do you have the evidence in your life that God is doing what he said he would do? He said that he would cause you to keep his commandments. He said that he would write his law on your heart. He said that he would change you, that he would put his spirit in you. 
All those Ezekiel 36, 26, you read that when you get home. It's God saying, I, I will, I will, I will, I will. All those things God said, I will do this. I will do that. Those are declarations of what God promises that he will do in the new covenant. He said, I will do these things for you. So the question you got to ask is, how can I believe and trust John 3.16 with all my heart and base my eternity on it when I take Ezekiel 36.26 or 1 John Chapter 3, verse 10, and I chunk it out the window. How can I possibly have assurance? How can I possibly say, because I have done X, Y, or Z, that God accepts me when what God promised to do in those he has adopted is not being done in me? I don't understand that. I don't understand that. And the only explanation is because our hearts are desperately wicked and they want what they want and they desire what they desire. And you will always do what you desire always. So what you need is not to say, you know what? I got to do better. What you need is a new heart. You need a heart that is tailor made to desire what God desires. You need a heart that is created from above, that has been born again, that has the spirit of the living God inside of it that says, I desire now what God desires. You're always going to do what you love. You're always going to do. And there's a story once, and I'll close with this. Is This is just a story. It's not true. But if somebody used it, uh, it's, if, if you went to the doctor... And the doctor says, you know what? Your life is going to be better and you're going to be happier and everything's going to go good if you'll just give up chocolate. He would never say that, but this is just a story. But if he said, look, everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be happy. It's going to be fine. You'll just get so much more enjoyment out of life if you'll just stop eating chocolate. And you say, you know what? I need a little more enjoyment. I need a little more in life. I need to be happy. I've been in the slump a little lately. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give up chocolate. I'm going to do that. That's that's a good idea. If that's all it is to it, I'm good. But if your heart loves chocolate, you know what's going to happen? You're going to do good for a few weeks. You're going to do good for a few months. But boy, you have a bad day. Somebody at work ticks you off. Some kids running around, stress, bad things going on. You know what you're going to do? You're going to say, man, I deserve to have a piece of chocolate today. I sure do. And you know what? I'm just going to do it. It's not going to take long before you go back to what you love. But if you go to that same doctor and he says, son, if you put another piece of chocolate in your mouth, you're going to drop dead. You're going to drop dead and you it'll be over. They're going to put you in the ground tag on the toe dead. I don't care how stressed you get. I don't care what happens. I don't care what kids yelling. I don't care what goes on at work. Well, I sure feel bad and I'm stressed and I deserve something, but I don't want no chocolate. (laughs) Why? Because you love your life more than you love pleasure. You're always going to go after what you love. So if you walk out of here with an idea of, man, I just got to straighten up. You might straighten up for a few weeks. You might start doing better. If you walk out of here going, man, I need to love people more. I've done it. You might work at it and you might strive for it. You might, you might, you might push for it. You might make arrangements for it, but sooner or later, you're always going to fall back on what you love. What you need, what I need is a heart that's changed to love it, to love what God wants for us. Not just to do it because, well, that's what we're supposed to do. And I want to be good and I want to do what we're supposed to do. And that's what God tells me to do. So I got to follow his commands. So I better go on and do it. That's not going to last you a lifetime. You have to be born again from the spirit of God. And you have to have new affections. You have to have a new love. You have to become a new creature because the old one is always going to fall back on what it loves. It's always going to fall back on the flesh. And so today, the question is, don't walk out of here and say, how am I doing? I can tell you already, you're not doing good. Don't walk out of here and say, I need to do better. We all need to do better. It's not the point. 
The point is you need to examine yourself and what you love. If you love fishing more than you love God, then you go fishing more than you serve God in your life. If you love shopping more than you love God, then you spend more time shopping than you do seeking after God, following after God, searching for God, chasing after God. If you love family, if you love job, if you love money, if you love free time, if you love having fun, riding motorcycles, you put anything in that blank. If you love that more than God, then you spend more time doing that than you do seeking after God. It's a fact. Prove me wrong. You can't do it. Whatever your time goes to, that's your God. That is your God. I'm not talking about we have service three times a week. A lot of people here this morning wasn't here tonight. But besides that, how much time during the day on Monday, how much time when you get home on Monday night do you spend seeking after God, wanting to hear from God, wanting to serve God, wanting God to change you, just wanting to be in the presence of God? What you spend, if you spend your time watching TV more than you do searching after God, seeking after God, chasing after God, wanting to be in his presence, then that's your God. Wherever you spend, wherever you sacrifice your life, Wherever you sacrifice your time, that's your God. That's who you serve. If it's just, you know, hey, I love my recliner just as much as anybody else. But if that's what I live for, that's what I can't wait home, can't wait to get home to get to. My free time is my God. My my rest time is my God. My my me time is my God. What he's saying here. Last thing we'll leave. This is how the children of God are manifest. This is how we know who they are. This is how we know who the children of the devil are. Whosoever lives after, doeth, walks after, chases after righteousness. Whosoever doesn't, okay, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not chasing after righteousness, is not seeking his kingdom, his righteousness. He is not of God. That's a bold statement for John to make, especially since I've said this two or three times in the early service. John didn't know all the people that would read his letter. I mean, he wrote this letter, scripture, God inspired it. Holy Spirit inspired this letter and John sent it to the churches. He didn't know personally all the people who'd read this letter. He sure didn't know the people 2000 years from now that would read this letter. But he could say without classification, without uh, without a mitigating circumstance, he could say without apology, everyone who's been born of God follows after righteousness. Everyone who has been born of God purifies himself. Everyone that has this hope purifies himself. And everyone who doeth not righteousness is not living after a pattern of chasing after God and seeking after obeying God and serving God. They are not of God. He can say that because it's a fact. It's a fact for you. It's a fact for you. It's a fact for me. It's a fact for my grandmother. It's a fact for Sophie. It's a fact. You and I cannot have assurance. You can't have peace. Are you kidding? You can't have joy. You can't have. Those are fruits of the spirit of God. How could you think that I'm going to try to do something that's going to make me happy, work to make me happy, learn new truths that are going to make me happy, uh, get into a bunch of theology books or Christian living books, and that's going to make me happy. Everybody's got a new program. Everybody's got a new book. Everybody's got a new teaching series that they have the secret that's been lost to the church for 2000 years. It's all. You, you know what I'm going to say? I said it this morning. If it's not about Jesus Christ and him crucified, throw it in the trash. Amen. Amen. So what I'm telling you today is you got to examine yourself. You are either sitting here today. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. And the way that's manifest is by looking at your life. I don't care how many times you've been baptized. I don't care how many times you walk down the carpet. I don't care if you was five years old, eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. I don't care if I'm the one who prayed with you, if I'm the one that explained the gospel to you, if God is not doing what God promised to do in your heart, you're not of God. 
I'm not saying you're doing it good. I'm not saying that you got it all going on or you got to reach this level in order to be assured that you have salvation. I'm saying if God is not molding you, making you, you have no reason to be assured of your salvation. You understand? You understand? I hope you understand. I guess we'll end, I guess we'll end by just asking you to examine yourself. You examine yourself whether you be the faith or not. All of you, I, I'm looking around, there's not many visitors here. I don't know if there's any visitors here, but all of you, all of you have been part of our church. I say our church for a long time. Some of you longer than others. All of you have heard this message before. It's nothing new. It's nothing absolutely new. Jesus once told a parable. And this is so, it's so frightening to me. It's the parable of the sower and the seeds. You know it better than I do. It's so frightening to me because there's only one kind of seed. There's only one kind of soil that goes to heaven. There's only one kind of soil that produces fruit. Of course, you know, the, the flat rock, the flat path on the, by the wayside. I mean, there's nothing there. The seed just falls. It lays on top. Birds come take it away. Satan comes, steal the word. Those middle two soils scare me to death because the rocky soil and the thorny ground, both of those two receive the word with gladness and they rejoice. So understand what he's saying. They receive the word and they rejoice. So by by modern standards, You would say, wow, they're Christians. Praise God. It says, but on the one hand, the thorns, the cares of the world, they choke that out and they fall away. And then on the rocky soil, there's no root. They never, they never trusted in Christ. There's no root there. And when the sun comes up, the tribulation of the world, the trials of the world just scorches it and it's gone. You and only you have to understand. You have to decide. You have to examine yourself and say, am I one of those that received the word with gladness and rejoiced and then fell away from it? Or am I the soil that produces a hundredfold, 200 fold of fruit? Maybe there was a time in your life. Maybe there was a time here that you were just, I mean, you would have served, you would have done anything. You would have cleaned the toilets with the toothbrush if God asked you to do it. You would have been here to do everything that we, that we offered to do. You would have been here. I remember the time when all the men stayed till 10 or 11 o'clock cooking hamburgers on East Main. You would have done whatever it took. If God asked you, there's nothing I won't do. Nothing I won't be. I'll be there until until. The last man leaves and I'll be there and fellowship with him. If my brother needs me, I'm going to be right there. And then the cares of the world. The sun came up and scorched. And now the focus of your life is not serving Christ, seeking after Christ, following his, chasing after his kingdom, his righteousness. But the focus of your life is just getting by. I mean, I got a lot going on. I got a job. I got kids. I got the the focus of your life is just getting through the day. Is that peace? Is that joy? Is that happiness? Is that what that is? Because if that's peace, I don't want none of it. I don't need it. If that's joy, if joy is just popping in here whenever you get ready and popping out and not being invested, not being part of the body, not investing in your life. If that's what gives you joy, then I don't want no part of it. I don't want none of it. Peace comes as a fruit of the spirit. And only you know, only you know if you've been born again. And John makes it clear right here. You can't trust your heart. Your heart's wicked. The evidence that you've been born again is that God is moving in your heart and you're chasing after righteousness. And there will be times when you step off the path. But what's going to happen is that spirit's going to rise up in you and God, the good father, the good shepherd, he's going to come with that shepherd's crook 
and he's going to grab you and he's going to bring you back. I heard a story. Who was it told me a story about the shepherd breaking the lamb's leg? Was that you? It was you, wasn't it? Breaking the lamb's leg so he, he couldn't run away again. God's going to do whatever it takes. His children ain't running away. His children ain't being burned up. His children aren't going to be choked off by the cares of the world and him stand by going, dang, I wish that wouldn't have happened. No. God is all powerful and he's going to do whatever it takes. So the question you got to ask is, am I a child of God or am I a child of the devil? If the answer to that question comes in, well, I believe that there was a man named Jesus, you're not in the same ballpark. If the answer to that question comes, and I'm not talking about you believe, believing in Christ is what saves you, but it's believing on Jesus that saves you. Not just believing there was a guy named Jesus in Palestine 2,000 years ago. If the answer to that question is, I'm doing pretty good, I'm doing better than Joe down the road, you're not even in the same ballpark. You're not even, you're not even talking the language that the apostles are talking. The answer to that question is, is God moving me to holiness, to seek after him, to serve him, to chase after him and to seek his presence, no matter what the cost, no matter what the sacrifice, no matter what it takes, I'm going to chase him until I get to be glorified in his presence until I either die trying or he splits through those clouds and comes and gets me. I'm going to be chasing after him. And that's the question that you have to answer. And I'm so thankful that we're here in a church where the gospel is preached. It's preached. Brother Johnny preaches. Brother Eddie preaches the gospel every time. That's the only preaching there is. Everything else is just speaking. Unless you're proclaiming the gospel. And we're in a church where we have a family here that understands that it's easy to miss it. It's easy to miss it. Today you you come and you give yourself to him. You turn your heart over to him. You say, God, I, I need to be saved, but I need a heart. I need you to change my heart, to love what you love, to hate what you hate, and to just seek after you the rest of my life because my heart's defective. I won't do it. If you leave it up to me, I won't do it. If you leave it in my hands, I can't make it. If you leave it in my power, it's not going to happen. I might do good for a week or two, might do good for a month or two, might do good for a year or two, but eventually I'm going to go back to what I love. I need you to change what I love. I need you to make me a new creature. I feel like I should say something else, but I don't have nothing else to say. I don't know if that's even enticing. Let's pray together. Father, we love you.